It's Tuesday, July 12. In the headlines, government departments urged to develop and implement a complaints management system. Regionally, Carpahead allays monkeypox fears in the region. And internationally, a new prime minister for the UK comes September 5. In sports, reggae girls qualify for FIFA World Cup. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I am Simone Absalom Gale. Develop and implement systems that allow complaints to be logged. This assertion was made by Acting Principal Director of the Public Sector Modernization Division, Carleen Mackenzie Spencer, who notes that implementing a complaints management system is an integral part of the process of achieving service excellence. Speaking at a recently held JIS think tank, Mrs. Mackenzie Spencer said that the information provided through such a system would better enable entities to serve customers' needs. Mrs. Mackenzie Spencer says, quote, We have been working closely with various ministries to develop requirements for the establishment of complaints management systems. That is something that is in train, and we hope to develop that in the next few months. End quote. The think tank was held to discuss the service excellence policy, which is a part of a broader modernization initiative implemented by the PSMD in the office of the cabinet. Cabinet approved the policy in March 2022. Jamaica's service excellence policy will be launched on Wednesday, July 13 at the office of the Prime Minister beginning at 10 a.m. The government is working on a project to see how they can put brown seaweed, known as sargassum, to good use. Research shows that sargassum plays a role in beach nourishment and is an important element in shoreline stability. Excessive amounts of the open ocean algae may result in beach erosion and disruption in the visual landscape. Speaking at a recent International Fishermen's Day conference in Clarendon, Chief Technical Director in the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries, Orville Palmer, offered an update. One other thing that we have found so far is that the sargassum has a high level of cadmium, which is an element uh, which is found in the soil and the sea. And this is, so we'll have to do some further research to see how we can process it into value-added things like fertilizer and so on. But um, at the same time, being able to um, successfully eliminate or remove um, that impediment. Um, so that is something that we're actively working on as we speak. In June, the National Environment and Planning Agency, NEPA, placed the country on alert for the increase in sargassum along several beaches across the island. It has been a source of discomfort for fishers and swimmers who use some of the affected beaches. See, let them they can't go in the boat. See? But if going in the boat, they can grass, can't fish, can't go out. That's it, so we can't do nothing. We have to just stand, stand still, we can't go. See, see all the boat them push up on the land? Some in the water, they then still we can't go. Out. This grass, I know, mash up the engine, you know. I carry a little bead. I go up in the hole with pump to it, black hole, and then burn up the engine. Speaking at the conference, Principal Director of the Marine Branch, National Fisheries Authority, Stephen Smichael, explains that sargassum is a naturally occurring aquatic plant that is found in the Atlantic Ocean. Why we're seeing so much of it now is perhaps as a direct consequence of climate change. The water temperature is getting warmer, and with that, we're finding sargassum increasing in numbers and washing into the Caribbean. So it's not just Jamaica that's affected. It's all the Caribbean islands within the Caribbean region that is seeing these increased numbers of sargassum. The public is being reminded that the seaweed is not for consumption. Residents of Lloyd's in St. Thomas now have access to faster internet service. This after the recent launch of a tower in the community. Councillor John Lee says the new tower is appreciated especially by students who use the internet for online classes. The kids 
it is so much for them to know that they will actually have internet service direct to their home and now our online class and all of that won't be interrupted. I just want to say I am grateful and thanks to Digicel once more. Head of Public Relations at Digicel Elon Parkinson says getting the internet into rural areas is key to making up for the learning loss that has occurred over the last two years especially during the summer season when schools are closed but they still need to get that education experience because we all understand the learning loss that took place during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic and so this is again another of the reasons that we invested 70 million dollars to build these two sites one here in Lloyds the other in Harties in St. Thomas because look, St. Thomas is also on the up. You know, we have a major road investment taking place. We're seeing now new housing developments coming into view. On a regular day, some hold up cell phones in the air or walk to a certain spot in their communities. This resident says the new development will change that. I feel great about it, you know, because my phone ain't pick up over my yard. I know that it is here. My phone get um, H plus full blast. So I feel good, I feel excited, I can lay down in my bed and talk and I feel uncomfortable about it, yeah. The Marant Bay Examination Depot has been reopened. The facility reopened after motorists voiced their concerns, explaining the inconvenience of having to travel outside the parish to access another depot. All they are saying, we must go to the nearest depot. And the nearest depot is distance away, both from Poole in the east and Kingston in the west. Not everyone in St. Thomas want to leave the parish or know Kingston, especially what's going on now with the crime. Investigation by our news team revealed that the facility was closed due to lack of proper utilities like electricity. We have been informed that it has been reopened since our team visited the area last week. Examination depots carry out various transport services such as driver testing operations, motor vehicle fitness and inspection process. Jamaicans have the opportunity to purchase authentic Jamaican-made gifts and souvenir items for the upcoming Yuletide season. This as the annual Christmas in July trade show is being held between July 12 to July 13 at the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel in Kingston from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day. This year's staging will feature 180 producers of locally made items in the categories of desktop solutions, aromatherapy, decor, fashion and accessories, fine arts, souvenirs, processed foods and products made with organic and natural fibers. Director of Tourism Linkages Network, Carolyn McDonald Riley, says the show is being staged under the theme Tropical Wonderland and will also celebrate Jamaica 60 through the various items on display. Time now for this week's episode of Living Healthy. Two point five billion people need assistive technology, but more than a third are denied access. Look left and look right. That's one in every three people. We are just like everyone else. We just need assistance to access the world. Saya bantunya alat tulis itu namanya pen sama reglet. With my hearing aids, I can hear quite well means we can have nice conversations. We've been together for 60 years. The thought of being separated would break my heart. And assistive technology helps with that a huge amount. Access to technology alat bantu adalah hak asasi kita. Saya ingin kita mempunyai hak yang sama di masyarakat. I am totally blind. Being able to text and receive text, that's been life-changing. What I like about the digital is fourth grade. Can get around easier and quicker. Mentally, three people like me will have things like this, like, like I do. Things don't stay the same forever, they also change. Due to lack of funding, being a developing country, access is very difficult for people. But we can change that. We need to change that. When people see me walking with my three-wheeler, what they really should see is someone who's independent. Saatnya untuk mengubah itu. Quer seja temporário, quer seja permanente. Apakah ini saya? Apakah ini kamu? Apakah ini seseorang yang kamu kenal? Assistive technology touches everyone's life. 
time to ensure affordable access. No matter where we live, no matter who we are. Let's make sure everybody has high quality, cost effective and the appropriate assistive products we need. So, let's change lives together. In the business report, the government of Jamaica jumpstarts renewable energy thrust by participating in an electric vehicle trial. We take a look at that story, plus we have your usual market updates with Danita Rodney. As Jamaica continues towards sustainable energy, five government ministries have been invited to participate in the Government of Jamaica Electric Vehicle Trial Program. Under this Inter-American Development Bank-funded initiative, Flash Motors, Jamaica's first exclusively electric transport solution provider, has partnered with leading automotive distributor, Stewart's Automotive Group, to lend Build Your Dreams, BYD, brand electric-powered vehicles to the government bodies for a trial period. The program intends to give decision makers a first-hand understanding of the economic benefits, environmental safety benefits, and performance efficiency of electric vehicles. Now for your market updates. In foreign exchange trading for Monday, July 11, the US dollar sold for an average of $152.78, the Canadian dollar ended trading at $117.79, the pound sterling traded for $181.24, and the euro sold for an average of $156.82. The following reflects the movement of the JSC indices in Monday's trading session. The JSC index declined by 1,079 points to close at over 300,000 units. The junior market index advanced by 16 points to close at over 4,000 units. The combined market index declined by 864 points to close at over 300,000 units and the All Jamaican Composite Index declined by 1,593 points to close at over 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 107 stocks of which 44 advanced, 48 declined and 15 traded firm. Stocks Advance for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, Access Financial Services Limited and AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited. Stocks declined for 1834 Investments Limited, Barita Investments Limited, and Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances Limited. Trading firm were 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited Variable Preference, Community and Workers of Jamaica CCU Deferred Share, and Derrimon Trading Company Limited. The overall volume leaders were Pulse Investments Limited with over 2 million units, Doll Financial Services and Wigton Windform Limited Ordinary Shares with over 1 million units. In regional stocks, in Trinidad and Tobago, Clico Investment Fund was the volume leader with over 60,000 shares, followed by Calypso Macro Index Fund with 681 shares being traded. On the Barbados Stock Exchange, Epley Caribbean Property Fund Value Fund was the sole security trading 20,000 shares. In regional news, the Trinidad and Tobago Energy and Energy Industries Minister Stuart Young said he supports reports that despite the trend to renewables, there is agreement that oil and gas will continue to be important primary fuels for the coming decades. He also says that there are energy projects in the works for the Twin Islands. The minister notes a major boost will be given to natural gas production with the implementation of several new upstream undertakings. Next five years, there are other projects with gas reserves of 3 TCF, which are earmarked for sanctioning. Beyond this period, the mega projects such as Shell's Manatee project with gas reserves of 2.7 TCF, Woodside's, formerly BHP's, Deepwater Calypso project with gas resources of approximately 6.6 .6 TCF are due to come on stream. He listed the increased prices of oil, gas, ammonia and methanol from on the international markets from 2020 to 2022. And we must be prepared.
for both the highs and the lows. In order to benefit from improved energy prices, gas and oil outputs need to be accelerated. Oil prices have steadied as markets balance an expected drop in demand due to mass testing for COVID-19 in China against ongoing concerns over tight supply. Data showed Brent futures gained $0.08 cents to $107.10 a barrel, while West Texas Intermediate crude fell $0.70 cents to settle at $104.09 a barrel. And that was the business report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. In regional news, Executive Director of the Caribbean Public Health Agency, CARPA, is allaying CARICOM National's fears about the monkeypox outbreak. Dr. Joy St. John explains why there is no need to panic about cases being detected in the region. While CARPA has been active in its surveillance for monkeypox, Dr. St. John says there has been no need to set up an incident management system, as was the case for the COVID-19 pandemic. This particular strain of monkeypox is, is one that does not have a high mortality rate, number one. And number two, it is only passed by prolonged contact and exchange of body fluids. And so we're not dealing with the same level of transmissibility as we are seeing now with BA4 and BA5. Even vaccines cannot stop transmission. Vaccines stop the development or lower the risk of developing severe disease and dying. But this is not the case with monkeypox or else you would be seeing a mounting of a ramping up of vaccination production in the way that you did for COVID-19. That is not happening. The head of CARPA has confirmed receiving samples for testing from CARICOM member states. So, yes, there has been a confirmed case in Jamaica. And no, there has been no confirmed case in St. Lucia. CARPA was sent the samples um, of someone in St. Lucia and it was negative. So there's been no confirmed case in St. Lucia. And the well-publicized incident with an uh, uh, airline crew um, interacting on a plane, none of the passengers that were quarantined developed um, disease. She explains that this is nothing like COVID-19. We have an infectious disease that may be passed from person to person, but it is not on the same level as COVID-19. It's not airborne. It is not transmissible, except, as I said, close contact and exchange of body fluids. So in quick time, WHO declared that SARS-CoV-2 um, constituted a public health emergency of international concern, which is the step before pandemic. That has not been issued for monkeypox, even though a committee met and gave advice. And so that in itself also explains how CARFA is approaching monkeypox. Public servants in Grenada, whose salaries were deducted in November 2018 for protesting over a 2% gratuity payment offer, will also be reimbursed alongside teachers at the end of July. That's according to President of the Public Workers Union, Brian Grimes. On Thursday, June 30th, at the inaugural ceremony of his Cabinet of Ministers, Prime Minister Dickon Mitchell announced that teachers whose money was deducted in November of 2018 by the previous administration will be reimbursed by the end of July. Understanding that both teachers and other public officers who were part of the protest action in 2018 experienced deductions in their salaries 
President of the Public Workers Union, Brian Grimes, says in order to seek clarification, an official letter by the union was sent to the newly elected Prime Minister, Dickon Mitchell, on July 4th to inquire if other public officers will be refunded their salaries. Grimes stated that the following day, a letter of response was received from the Permanent Secretary of Finance, Mike Sylvester. Yes, the Grenada Public Workers Union is, is happy to announce to our membership that the dock salary in question, um, based on the statements made by the Honorable Deacon Mitchell at the swearing-in ceremony June 30th, um, that teachers will be getting the their dock salaries returned. Um, in fact, it's all public officers. The union took its time to seek clarification um, from the government of Grenada, and we got a response um, via PS in the Ministry of Finance, Mr. Mike Sylvester, that it will be returned to all public officers and not just teachers. So the start of the competitive bid round for Trinidad's onshore and nearshore acreage has been launched. For U.S. $30,000, energy companies, both local and foreign, can purchase a data package to take a closer look at this country's oil fields. This is the word from Energy and Energy Industries Minister Stuart Young. The legal instruments establishing the onshore bid round were effected on Friday the 8th of July 2022. So the onshore bid round is now open and we are looking forward to much interest in our onshore blocks. The minister noted the bid round will remain open for potential bidders to offer sealed bids on the country's oil and gas acreage for the next six months. Trinidad and Tobago's gas industry is at the point where we need to convert our prospective gas resources of that 55.2 BCF to reserves. To this end, the government is pursuing an ambitious bid round program. He added the previous round of bidding on the deep water acreage ended on June 2nd with four blocks receiving bids. Minister Young was speaking during the opening ceremony of the Geological Society of Trinidad and Tobago's three-day conference at the Hyatt Regency on Monday. In news further afield, come September 5, the United Kingdom will have a new Prime Minister. Al Jazeera explains the process and highlights who are the front runners. The UK is sweltering through a midsummer heat wave, but the country's political temperature has been at boiling point for days now. And I want you to know how sad I am. Following the Prime Minister's resignation announcement last Thursday, Conservative MPs of the 1922 committee gathered to set the rules and timetable for how to replace Boris Johnson. Nominations will open and close tomorrow. We'll have a first ballot on Wednesday and a second ballot is likely on Thursday. What we try to do is find a balance where we're making sure the parliamentary stages are concluded reasonably rapidly before the summer recess, uh, but we do believe we can have that proper discussion within the party. Someone has to grip this Conservative vote. MPs are aiming to whittle down a wide field of candidates to just two by next Thursday. Then, over the rest of July and August, the party's 200,000 members will choose the next leader and Prime Minister. It's a tight schedule, but they want all this done by early September. Well, I think it's a wide open race and ultimately the Conservative Party are going to be worried about the, the blue on blue attacks. I think that doesn't look good to the wider electorate, so they're going, they're going to want to try and shorten that uh, as much as they can. I think it looks like Rishi Sunak is the front runner and he is the man to catch. There is one person in all of this who has been conspicuous by his absence. Boris Johnson, of course, who's been pretty quiet since his resignation speech last week. Well, he was out in front of the cameras again on Monday. Where does he stand on the race to replace him? Look, I, I, I don't want to say I, any more about all that. There's a, there's a contest underway and that must happen. And, you know, I would, wouldn't want to damage anybody's chances by offering my support. I just have to, to get on. I, I have to get on. Meanwhile, the opposition has picked up on the generous promises of tax cuts Conservative leadership hopefuls are falling over themselves to make and found them laughable. The arms race of fantasy economics is well underway. Over the weekend, the contenders have made more than £200 billion pounds worth of unfunding spending commitments. £200 billion. 
Let that sink in. That's more than the annual budget of the NHS splurged onto the pages of the Sunday papers without a word on how it will be paid for. Fantasy will soon meet reality. Galloping inflation, economic stagnation and a major war in Europe, just a few problems from the Prime Minister's intray. It may be scorching now, but for whoever wins, things will only get hotter. In sports, Jamaica cemented their spot in the upcoming 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup. This will be the second time the reggae girls qualified for back-to-back -back FIFA Women's World Cup tournaments. This comes off the heels of a 4-0 victory over Haiti on Monday night to take the runner-up spot in the Group A and qualify for the semi-finals at the CONCACAF Championship in Mexico. Captain Khadija Shaw led the way for the Jamaicans with a double strike in the 59th and 70th minute, while Trudy Carter in the 26th and Drew Spence. The United States tops Group A with a maximum nine points after defeating Mexico 1-0 to finish three points ahead of Jamaica. Captain Shaw shared what this second qualification means for Jamaica. It means a lot, you know, especially throughout the beginning of the campaign, we came under a lot of pressure. You know, and we just stuck together, we held our composure, we know that once we stick together and play our game, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to be victorious. And I think it just goes to show that, you know, we're a small island, but we can do big things. Haiti, who finished third place, will advance to next February's 10-team 2023 Women's World Cup playoff in New Zealand. Meanwhile, Canada booked their spot in Thursday's semi-finals after beating Costa Rica 2-0 in their top-of-the-table clash in Group B. Thursday's semi-finals will see Jamaica facing Canada at 9 p.m. after the United States take on Costa Rica at 6 p.m. Khadija Shaw shares her thoughts on the upcoming match. Yeah, I think, you know, we just need to remain confident, stay positive and support each other and communicate 100% because it shows from the first game, you know, we, we, we won the first game, obviously the second game didn't go according to plan, but, you know, we came out here and, you know, we said we're going to give it a final push. So I think, you know, just the confidence of the girls, if we can stick together as a team and continue pushing, I'm sure we can do big things. The West Indies registered their sixth straight defeat against Bangladesh in the ODI format on Sunday in Guyana during a low-scoring encounter. But Windy's captain Nicholas Buran is not worried about that result. On a low, slow Providence pitch, the Windies' batting faltered yet again, finishing the curtailed match on 149 for 9. Puran says although the conditions were tough, they should have gotten more. Uh, we definitely didn't, we didn't have enough runs on the board. I felt like you know, anytime we get anything close to 200, 175 on that, you know, that will be definitely be interesting to see how the game play out. I didn't say that um, we could have bowled a bit better as well in the power play. I think we're still leading as a team, we're still asking our you know, spinners to get wickets, our new ball bowlers to get wickets for us. So, you know, it's going to be a challenge for us, but we just need to keep figuring it out and finding ways to win cricket games, especially in ODI format. Bangladesh got to 151 for four, winning convincingly by six wickets. However, Gurukesh Moti had an impressive ODI debut even under pressure. Getting his opportunity in front of his home ground, home crowd and delivered. Um, unfortunately, on the losing side, but in the way he bowled nine overs, 18 one wicket, that was you know, fab fabulous. And you know, expecting him to continue to bowl like not only in the series, but you know, in his future. Even though the Windy's outcome was below par, Puran noted that the world should expect great things from this crop of new players. A really um, young team. We, we reflect a lot, we do a lot of homework and we are trying to get better as a team and as cricketers. And again, you see the guys running around with energy and you know, I can't ask for any more as a captain on the field. I just hope that we could continue to learn, we could you know, continue to get the support of you know, the management, the coaching staff, the fans, the media, everyone. You know, just continue to back us and I believe that we will do brilliant things in the future. The second ODI takes place on Wednesday in Guyana. Windy's all-rounder Jason Holder is set to make a grand return to the regional team for the upcoming series against India later this month. Holder, one of the world's top all-rounders, took an extended break from the game after the Indian Premier League, but confirmed on the cricket program line and length that he is ready to represent the Windies again. After the IPL, and I was just mentally and physically drained. Um, I felt that time was, was the best time to take some time off and you know, just really spend some time for myself and to try to get myself back into back into you know full flow and full shape. Um, it was a hard decision to make, you know, but I felt it was the right decision at that time. 
looking forward to getting back out there and representing the West Indies. And you know, it's, been, it's going to be a, a hectic year to come. Um, there's quite a bit of cricket to be, to be played, and there's obviously a World Cup at the end of the year as well too. So looking forward to that. And that's the news on PBCJ. Be sure to follow us on our social media pages at PBC Jamaica. Remember, we are the People's Station.